I want to say, first of all, thank you very much to Vendasta for hosting me this afternoon and for welcoming me to such a fun and exciting event. I had no idea that you guys did this and that this was happening here in Saskatoon. So it's really nice to be part of this and to emerge from my life with four tiny children and books and chaos uh, to the peace and calm and fun and excitement and energy that comes from being in this room. So thank you for having me. My talk today is called Where Writers Discover Ideas and Inspiration. The theme for today is language and literature. And I think all of the speakers, certainly the two I've been chatting with so far this afternoon, are focusing on how we share through language our creativity. I'm going to talk about me and my writing a little bit and where my ideas come from. I'm not a marketer, I'm not a salesperson, I'm just a writer. But perhaps for some of you that will be interesting, either because you yourself have ambition or ideas about writing for yourself, or perhaps you want to take some of those ideas and think about them in your own creative work, because it seems to me there's a lot of creative people and a lot of creative energy in this room. So I have no idea if any of this is applicable to people who don't write books, but that's what I'm going to talk about. Oh, there we go. So when you're a writer, the question that you get asked most often is where do ideas come from? My work, I go into schools, I go to talk to grown-ups, I go all over the place doing talks about writing and invariably somebody will feel that they want me to try and pin down that answer. So Dr. Seuss, who's a children's author I admire, said, I get all my ideas in Switzerland near the Forker Pass. There is a little town called Gletsch, and 2,000 feet ab above Gletsch, there is a smaller hamlet called Ubergletsch. I go there on the 4th of August every summer to get my cuckoo clock fixed. And while the cuckoo is in the hospital, I wander around and talk to the people in the streets. They are very strange people, and I get my ideas from them. <laughs> I feel like he was teasing this idea that there's any way to pin down a real answer about where inspiration comes from. And yet my entire creative life and my entire career is built around the fact that ideas do come to me. I have learned to listen when that little voice inside sparks up with something. I've learned to make notes through the years, to take even the most silly or frivolous of ideas seriously. A while ago, when I was at a writing festival, one of the other authors, who I have no idea what her name was, talked about exactly where she thought inspiration comes from, and she said it came from two places. Inspiration came from your imagination plus your observation. So the first word there should actually read imagination, but there you go. <laughs> That's what happens when you're trying to make a presentation and your three-year-old is trying to sit on your head and saying, mommy, mommy, talk to me. Your imagination and your observation. For me, breaking that down means that sometimes when I get stuck, when I'm not feeling creative, when I don't have ideas coming to me, I take a little step back and I have a think about those two sides of it. So firstly, observation, what does that mean to me? Well, when you're a writer, it means looking out at the world. It means paying attention to the news. It means going to art galleries, looking at other people's work, reading a ton, listening to what other people are saying. Any of you who live here in Saskatoon, and I think that's most of you who are in this room, if you're in a coffee shop and I'm nearby, my headphones don't always have music playing. I'm actually just listening to you and maybe making notes on what you're saying. Not because I'm going to use it in a story, but because I'm just opening myself up to what is going on in the world, what the pulse is of the world outside me. But sometimes that's tiring. There's a lot going on in the world that's sad and difficult and challenging and depressing and not exciting creatively. And so if I start to feel like that, then I switch off the outside world and I look in. And I don't know if this will be helpful to any of you, but I understand we come from a culture where busyness is valued extremely highly. And I don't 
at all value being over busy. So I actively make time every day to take a little time to do nothing. I used to smoke heavily, so every day I would have like 20 five minute breaks in a day and then I stopped smoking and suddenly I didn't have those 20 five minute breaks and I'm just standing around doing nothing but smoking. And in all seriousness, that is a great benefit to my health, I'm sure. But it was a loss to that little bit of time when I wasn't surrounded by other people or other things. Now, believe me, when you have a one-year-old, a three-year-old, a five-year-old, a seven-year-old, I have two books coming out next year. I'm teaching online at the University of Toronto and in three other places starting up right now. I do talks all the time. It's not that I couldn't answer all the time that I'm busy, but I genuinely think it's important to take a little time to nurture my imagination. It's a muscle, I believe, and I think, like any muscle, it needs a little time to work out. And the way for me to work my imagination out is to do nothing, is to have a hot bath, is to stare into space, is to look out the window, is to walk the dog across the street and just stand there for a couple extra minutes after the dog has finished doing a crap, just waiting to see what my imagination comes up with. And it does come up with stuff. It asks that question, what if, which is so essential to creativity. What if things were not as they are right now? What if they were completely different? So despite the fact my slide is wrong, it should say imagination plus observation. I think all of you understand what I'm trying to say. So I've written lots of books, and I've written lots of books that also are not published. Uh, so that, for me, means that I've learned along the way to take the risk that some of my ideas don't work out, and that's OK. Sorry, this is going to need to replay. The fact of it is, is if you take risks creatively, it's not always going to be successful. Some of your books are going to work. They're going to sell really well. They're going to do lots of things. Some of your ideas are just going to blow Vendastra out of the water. Some of your ideas are going to speak to other people and connect. Some of them may not connect for 10 years, 20 years, ever in your lifetime. Some of them are just dumb. And that's okay, too. To have ideas, you have to be open to what they are. You have to be wise enough to trust that your imagination will eventually get there, but it might take a little rewriting. So the one up in the top here, Violet and Victor write the best ever bookworm book. I think it has 674 words in it. Not that I was counting. I rewrote it 300 times at least, and I'm not joking. The art of finessing an idea is the hard work that comes afterwards. So yes, you get inspired, but then you have to push it. You have to take it in certain directions. So sometimes I feel like expressing myself in other creative ways. I have this notion that I'm a reasonably good dancer. So sometimes I'll listen to a song and I try to express myself physically, much to the amusement of my children. But actually, if I take some of the idea stuff that's happening while I'm listening to that piece of music and use my form, which is writing, sometimes that's picture books, sometimes that's young adult books, sometimes that's an essay, rarely is it a poem. If I do that, then I start to push myself in the way I most know how to do. So each of us have creative impulse, but each of us also have strengths. And sometimes writing is bloody hard work, and it's boring, and I don't care what any other writer tells you. They're either lying or just really, really fucking lucky. But really, what it is, is that you have to go through the parts when you need to work really, really hard, when you don't want to sit down at the desk, when you don't want to work through yet another draft of your awful, awful, awful book, to give it the chance of appearing in the world of being something that other people want to see. I always tell myself the first draft, when the ideas come, is not the last draft. The last draft is the bit that you get to show the world and other people. And my job is to take those ideas and that inspiration and really push myself to work as hard as I can. I have two new books coming out next year, and both of them have come from ideas that I had a long time ago. The idea for Me and Me, which is my next YA novel, came from a book idea I was working on when I was 18. It just took me 20 years, just about, to understand technically how to make that idea real. And it may be when you work in the tech industry that sometimes there isn't the possibilities yet for you to fulfill what your idea is. I didn't have the skill as a writer to do the things I needed to do with me and me. 
Polly Diamond, which is my first chapter book, which will be for my daughter, who's just about the right age for it now. She's just about five now. She was a baby when I wrote the first draft. I was pregnant with her when I had the first idea. So even though I'm talking about where ideas come from, there has to be a realistic consideration of what happens when those ideas come to fruition. And not all of them do. For every book I've written, I have a strange habit of writing a second book that never goes anywhere. That just goes in a file in my desk for my eyes only, and I never know which one it's going to be, which is a little heartbreaking. But that's just how I work creatively. You said this clock would tell me where time was, but I don't understand it at all, so I'm just going <laughs> to keep talking. Three tips to find your inspiration. So these are the things I do as a writer, and these are specific to writers, so take what you will from them if you're not a writer yourself. Read like crazy. Read, read, read. The world is full of ideas. It's full of smart people. It's full of people telling you how they see the world. Open yourself up to those ideas, whether you like them or not, whether they write badly or well. Read everything you can. Don't flatten your ideas. Trust, stay open. Edit your ideas later. Sure, there is the stage where you need to work really hard. Certainly, that's been my experience. But there is also the stage where you have to nurture your idea like it's a little tiny flame, and you have to let it have time to set the world on fire. And make time to do nothing. It's actually the most important thing I do in my day, despite all the other stuff I have going on. I wrote my first novel because I wanted to read it. Your ideas need to go to you first of all. If you're trying to fulfill somebody else's expectations, your idea doesn't really have a hope. Ideas are precious and small to start with, and they need a little space where they can open up before you start thinking about how other people are going to see them. It's quite scary taking your ideas, particularly if you're a writer, but probably in whatever it is all of you guys do too. And taking those outside too soon, too fast, too early is a surefire way to take any possibility of a good idea and killing it. If opportunity doesn't knock, build a door. It may be that the world doesn't know it needs another book by me. Well, it maybe doesn't need it yet, but later, when a teenager writes to me and says, I hadn't read anything until I read Life on the Refrigerator Door, and turning those pages really made me want to start reading again, or really made me want to connect with my mother, or I love Violet and Victor so much I want to write my own books now. I didn't know those people needed that story at that time in their life. That's not really my business. My job is just to build the door and to do my best with it. You can make anything by writing. And what that means to me is that you can open the world and make it new if you trust the stories and the creativity inside of you. I try to do that. I try to do that with the games I play with my kids. I try to do that when I'm desperately trying to figure out what to make for supper in like half an hour when I have four screaming children who are starving and ready to eat. I try to pull from that creative source that's inside me to tell the stories I need to tell, to stay calm in a choppy, busy, crazy world, and really believe that the things I have to say, maybe the things that I need to say, are worth saying, whether for other people or whether just for me, is at the idea stage completely irrelevant. So I have lots of writing prompts for any of you who are interested in taking your writing a little further. I have them on Instagram. I have a website, alicekuypers.com. I'm easy to find online. I have a newsletter that has writing tips and prompts and ideas about writing, ideas about books I've loved. If any of you are feeling inspired to start reading a little more fiction, not necessarily by me, I give lots of ideas about books and writing and the world that I live in. Thank you so much for having me. I think I'm pretty much at my 15-minute window. <laughs>